Hello everyone, today we talk about 12th century empire and kingdom of Germany and the rise of the Orange Taufen. You know that we have dedicated this point, I would say, not an enormous but s still, you know, a consistent uh, amount of space to this dynasty that is arguably in the, let's say, the, the broader possibilities, at least in potential of um, universalistic recomposition of uh, the Western Christendom and beyond, uh, because of, of course you know the the, the the conquest of Constantinople was always uh, an option, but let's say properly of, of of a secular rule, in fact all over all over uh, all over Europe and the Mediterranean. Um, I guess you you know what I'm talking about. It's uh, um, one of the, the big medieval history uh, topics right that I, I know really are actually less considered than than one would, would, would even imagine to think sometimes I found people that were also from very specific background also involved in medieval history sometimes in coming from the same birth places we could argue of the Hohenstaufen uh, that were completely like even I don't know reenactors people involved in this thing were completely oblivious like they, they had never heard not of the Holland stuff and themselves but say of what this this whole thing was about and why it was so important and the you know the struggles within the same within the same Germany um, Italy the uh, uh, dynastic sum of the uh, say addition of the uh, of the kingdom of Sicily this, the fact that by the, the second half of the 12th century, the Germanic Empire was really the, the most powerful uh, uh, domination in in Europe, and that there was a, you know, a very concrete possibility in mul on multiple occasions for this thing to to actually achieve the reunification of West and East, and consequently lots of other uh, interesting things, and um, it's. Um, it's also difficult to study this period, I would say, because it's start it starts really to be dense of events and exactly the universalistic reach, um, uh, internationally speaking, of of uh, the Hohenstaufen policy uh, had major uh, major influence on so many different countries, right? And 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 vice versa, by the way, because you can't really study this period and thinking that I don't know. Even the most minimal dynastic change in the Ultramar states, right, or in the Italian communes, um, didn't have an impact on, on this, the, the broader international balance. And in fact, um, I, I, I must say, I discovered this period mo indirectly, mostly by reading uh, the, the famous um, uh, work about Manuel Comnenus by Magdaleno, he's one of the great Byzantinists. Um, you know, Anglo-Saxon literature and so on. That, of course, uh, you know, the emperor being contemporary to to Frederick the First, essentially. And th there is there a very insightful mm, description of properly this this games of power and how effectively, even I don't know, Mulferat, for example, was the uh, the wedge there that made the, the whole was the cornerstone that made the whole balance at some point swinging here and there. You can imagine how complicated and calibrated international policy could be, given that Montferrat was not even a dramatically, you know, powerful entity, but still was very important, for example, for the Northern Italian uh, imperial policy. There were strong uh, staunch ghibellines and so on. And you can imagine in front of much larger powers like Hungary, for example, say the same Byzantine Empire or France, how the most diverse things reflected uh, on this thing. You know, the, the most, the greatest blow, arguably, that arrived to the Hohenstaufen, at least in the period we're seeing, today we, we arrive up to the election of Frederick I, so we will see things later, but let's say, uh, aside from the incredible misfortunes that this dynasty underwent, properly also from a personal, uh, biological, dynastic, point of view, right, the premature death of Herod VI uh, arguably prevented 
the Germans to take Constantinople, which in a few years would have taken, famously enough, by the French and the Venetians instead. And that would have changed everything in Western history. Um, consequently, the same uh, minority of Frederick II um, and all the mechanisms that we have described at length in the world international policy that eventually was solved with the Battle of Bouvines, also for Germany and, uh, and Frederick's succession. Um, and all, also the same Frederick II's reign, all the troubles with the papacy in this, you know, in a moment in which, however, uh, that um, bigger universalistic dream was mm, at least being given up by certain dimensions, at least for what, especially the German policy consisted in at that point, the same Frederick II, very famously with the edict in favor of princes, as it was called, was just basically letting go, just uh, not not the you know, he had a very high sense of his German kingship, but let's say, you know, he realized in practice that there was no other way to maintain royal right but by essentially um, selling them, <laughs> paradoxically. And so actually building a private dom domination that even there, for, for dynastic reasons, for biological reasons, was cut short in an incredibly brutal way. You know, that the own stuff and at the end all made kind of a terrible end, in a way or another, they were more or less all assassinated or died in other ways, uh, and and so uh, there is this huge myth of the Swabian dynasty which lived on historically for for a multitude of reasons. Well, you can argue that um, this was the apogee of, of Western civilization in the Middle Ages, um, and that literally stemmed from, from the heart of, of Europe itself, like from Swabia, this crucial central European area, the crossroad between, you know, uh, in fact, Central Europe, France, Italy, and so on, that brought to this, uh, in fact, even in part because of its location to this specific project. No, no, no. As, as we will see, this was still in the wake of, of some German political traditions and continuities in royal power and so on. But what we look at at the Ohenstaufen that could have been, after all, just a dynasty like, like others before, like the Franconians that were important indeed and made also the same fortune of the Ohenstaufen that, that had you know emerged as in fact defeated, generally speaking, considering the struggle for the investigators with the papacy and so on. And instead, when we look at the Ohenstaufen, and we're seeing, in fact, a, a, a defeated dynasty, right? One of the greatest uh, defeats and one of the most um, spectacular, heroic, dramatic um, defeats that you can uh, imagine that were, in fact, also well uh, described that this enormous amount of literature, mythology, of, of symbolism and that lived on was also collected later on in, in the midst of, you know, of nationalism and other things. And that, however, you know, you know achieved among the other things, for example, the uh, re revival of Roman law, right? At least, you know, nurtured it heavily for reinforcing, you know, secular rule uh, in... in uh, competition with the papacy, and dreamed of the restoration of Christian universalism. And the reason why this is so important um, is that, you know, the Hohenstaufen's experience marks, on the political level, the, in fact, the acme, but also the end of of a world that you could say, like, it's as if it, was a, it, it were a medieval proposal, in a way, we have we have talked about the Holy Roman Empire. Made a video last summer specifically on 12th century Germany. What you know, all the if you if you want the ambiguities, the uncertainties, the the, the um, even in relatively um, um, for, in, informal rules that had formed, let's say what what the Holy Roman Empire properly substantiated itself in with with important. Uh, gray areas at, at, at the boundaries, uh, politically, ideologically. And this arguably was even the sap of, of the same of, of the same plan, right, that the empire 
ha had at that point under the, the Swabians, you know, almost achieved, uh, uh, went extremely close to achieve. And um, and that also, however, is 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 difficult to to understand from a merely um, modernistic standpoint. So that you know, I presume my my regular followers have been uh, surely many of them on their own already know what I'm talking about, and probably also better than me in certain cases. But you know, in general, also the, the more general audience has surely. Uh, through through my videos, you know, being exposed to to to, to the greatest um, questions and issues and noise answers of historiographical interpretation. So talking about the Hohenstaufen is always good because, in a sense, you would be surprised by by how historically still we have to understand about that period. It's not easy. Um, we uh, on this channel we often pointed out, for example, multiple times that the real peak of medieval universalism, the triumph of the feudal system, and so on, was actually embodied by France during the 13th century, right? Which uh, notoriously and, and um, was in fact the also the same moment of the sunset of the German monarchy, at least the the project of, of national. Of, of a national monarchy on the same base that had been proper of, of uh, in this se sense in fact of the same France that succeeded after instead centuries of much greater political confinement if you want within its own uh, boundaries right or also England that was born kind of more unitarily um, also forcefully but that's how you do things sometimes or even what the I don't know what the same Hohenstaufen came to 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 acquire the same kingdom of Sicily was the same the, the most centralized in Latin Germanic Europe, um, and that in this sense has to expose you also about a bit the nature of Germany itself. I plan to make videos to explain also from a broader spiritual and and military point of view. Uh, how it is, after all, that the Germans had managed to uh, to 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 monopolize uh, the imperial election and how this was maintained. There were lots of important historical contingencies, but it can't be seen just as an accident, right? It was something in in this uh, you know still half modern and half primitive, right, and nature of the Germanic kingdom. Uh, that is very well exemplified, even especially at the time of Frederick the First. That was the one that truly, you know, that, that Im imported that a, a true feudalism in Germany. Germany, of course, was was a post-Carolingian kingdom, had had a vassalatic beneficiary system, but up to the mid 12th century, wasn't as you know properly developed or you know, um, in fact, modern and you know and. Um, you can't argue p pacified, but, but that was never was for that matter, even later. But um, you know, it was something unique in its own kind. You can argue that Germany is still, in a in a sense, like every country, a unique country, but still, you know, quite unique in also by by kind, right? You you can't quite find the same thing, not even within the same Central Europe. Um, and uh, well, of course, we're talking from the throne first century standpoint so lots of things happen in the meanwhile but I mean um, as you know I I actually believe that much of, you know what, what the the nature of a people of a culture of a nation is is historically speaking it's, it's much more continuative than it seems right and this is not really a nationalistic at a nationalistic standpoint it, it is really a, a spiritual matter it's literally how people are you know nurtured with which ideas what what is that? Makes them different, and and there are important differences in, in this regard. So indeed, the the Germanic Empire at this point can be seen as in Ottonian times the the revival of some kind of northern force, right, of some kind of still primitive and you know warlike uh, and, and in fact spirited force that managed to to relaunch in spite of the enormous of difficulties that we have already seen, we will see better now, even of from a political institutional point of view, even to put things together to, for a concerted effort 
um, managed to, in fact, pursue this 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 broader policy, especially the Mediterranean one, and this is also why the the Hohenstaufen were criticized and, uh, in a silly way, especially by in fact 19th century nationalistic historiography, because you know they were said, oh why why didn't the true Germans thought about you know unifying their own country before going after strange chimeras and dreams and you know look at what the 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 Welfen were doing, not not what the Hohenstaufen were doing uh, by you know colonizing the East and uh, you know developing the answer and all. And of these true northern Saxons, you know, really thought just about their own land. They didn't want this this broader Roman thing. Um, and and that's that's kind of very funny because you know, as soon as Abelfan rose to the throne, it did the same exact thing that Jonstauf and the poli in the international policy. And it was objectively the, uh, the that's of course nationalism denying you know uh, universal values, which is you know of course nationalism properly has nothing to do with the, the, the moral strength of, of past peoples in anything. It's just a way for the, the average weak and, you know, purposeless individual to, to, to Dionysically feel part of something that, you know, that has a meaning because, of course, they can't find any meaning for, for their own personal existence. And so, but much, ma you know, as most, most, this ideology is especially emerging with mass societies from the 19th century kind of brought to all the disasters that you've seen from you know communism to racism to to, to nationalism statalism all these things of course they were the product also of a time but before launching these new forces and mechanisms into a world that has never seen them before you have to be very careful and we weren't very careful and you can argue that the, the mid 12th century was a similar time because Europe had never seen uh, such a, uh, a huge growth at that point. So, of course, the, um, I don't know, Frederick Barbarossa's empire is, is the product of this great uh, wave, that was this great tide that was mounting, and especially also in countries like Germany, in relative terms, was even higher than, than others historically, and that, therefore, these people were, were seizing as an opportunity to expand you know, to, to, to say, uh, make their forces overflow and taking over other spaces, other um, communities that up to that point had remained uh, factually beyond their reach. And this is the also the world deal of the empire, right? Given that the first objective was securing the Mediterranean, Rome, Italy, and so the access to, you know, the, the Holy Land and the Constantinople and so on. Um, uh, th this this situation was conflicting with the, you know, the the, the reality that imperial power in in those uh, regions had remained vacant for, for 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 generations, and that in the meanwhile, exactly because of this enormous growth, other other communities had developed and had you know matured their own sense of themselves, their own confidence, awareness. That's how the Lombard League could, you know, uh, compete with uh, with such such a power like this Swabian one in the first place, and even winning, by the way. So um, those are the stages. Make you say, well, of course we can't just cheer one side or the other, right? Even the same Lombard League, the communes, etc., are something very interesting. And of course, as modern people, we see them as like in, in a from a from a popular let's say, point of view, and, you know, uh, a democratic one, let's say, as the, this uh, forerunners of fact of democracy, of modernity, of secularization, but in a sense, uh, what about universal authorities, and what's their role, and what's their, you know, properly moral drive, and what's their responsibility that they are endowed, and how much strength it requires, and how, uh, imi imitatively speaking, this can benefit the, the world, and trying to keep it properly under uh, a single a single rule, right? Nobody at the time ever thought there was never such a thing like a, a secession from the empire. People who took arms against the emperor that didn't do it because they thought that there shouldn't be an emperor. Just like uh, emperors that took arms against the papacy, they never, never thought that there shouldn't be a papacy. It was about the ratios of power, the, the, the prerogatives, the, the autonomies 
the uh, you know in fact the liberties that these universal powers could could grant and so um, we have seen much of how this thing came to decline even because of the of the end of the Swabian dynasty in Germany last month we made lots of videos actually exactly in the second phase like from the German interregnum to say the mid 14th century and so the, the br brusque contraction after this period of decline that had already occurred in, in universal powers in the empire the papas and so on um, so here we are instead in a very different situation we are at the beginning or even before that because as we know uh, at starting I don't know from the early 12th century contextually the German kingdom presented itself as composed essentially by four great duchies that Today we call them like ethnic duchies, and people think that it literally means that they were the same peoples that you know they took the name from. Actually, not these things. Th those tribes had long gone, right? Uh, ever since you know the, the local aristocracy has already managed to take over, then eventually the, the Carolingian Empire properly you know boosted that even more dramatically. And so we're talking essentially about the great aristocracies of. Yes, of, of, of duchies that were surely also different in language, in identity, in, in ethnicity, broadly meant. Um, the same concept of a German right uh, identity, of a Eastern, Frankish, or Teutonic uh, nationality was something quite, you know, borderline perceived, to say the least. Um, still at this point, because in fact the system had kind of compacted itself rather to a federal fashion that, of course, also in, in German history still maintains and, and, and you know, uh, kind of characterized the same German identity, but exactly in this kind of a, idea of autonomy, right, towards the various Länder and their their historical traditions that sometimes could be quite 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 different, especially considering that, you know, what we call Germany today is not what was Germany at the time, even extensionally, right? Here you could have something like, it could stretch, in fact, from the Netherlands to Austria. I mean, two places that barely have anything to do with each other, if not, they, they, yes, they, they have some of this Germanic background, but, uh, you know, what about the historical traditions, the customs, the, the, the po political, institutional culture? I mean, um, yes, by the 12th century, um, differences were less marked, but th exactly this is true in general for the world at the time, meaning that you know it was much less interconnected in a way, and so nobody really saw anything specific to to praise, even in, in, in of a broader identity if it was not brought under a same a same ruler. So uh, the empire, in a way, had worked like this. Um, they so we're talking speaking of the ethnic Duchess, of course, so this this four peoples of Germanic stock that were settled you know, in German territory, the Bavarians, the Saxons, the Franconians, and these Webian Alamanni, let's say. There were others naturally historically, think about the Thuringians or but let's say uh, there were also being, you know, th at this point places were literally claimed and engineered as new German lands through the expansion towards the east, lands that had been inhabited by I mean, originally even by Germans, and then eventually had been Slavicized during the migration year, and then they were, you know, reconquered after this, and so also all the the blending between these populations, famously enough. Um, uh, in fact, as we were saying, we often say Germany doesn't quite have a boundary, especially in the eastern side, right? So the uh, also the German colonization went very far, right? Not being, you know, uh, just like a, a compact time sometimes, but just some islands, let's say. Of German-speaking communities, uh, say de dedicated to trade, to crafts, and so on, that also importantly stimulated the, the economies of other, of other, especially in the Western Slavic or Hungarian or the Baltic world. Say that they, they had, they they brought an important dynamism. Were incentivated by the same sovereigns to counter the local ethnic aristocracy, and so on. The same goes for I don't know German knights or Western knights broadly meant. Uh, at this point, so it's an it's a world in expansion, and Germany is, is surely the protagonist of this. But still, politically, it's it's loser, right? It, it's something that you know, yes, all these actors kind of uh, play, but the 
there is not much of a need nor of a enough centralized institutions that, or to to say uh, to enforce like a with, with iron fist like a compacting under a single rule a single uh, national monarchy right but there is surplus that that keeps going around so uh, ever more so um there is room let's say for doing something that from which the world system can benefit in a sense if the emperor that you know is supported by them can I don't know, extend its control on on other areas which again it's not much uh you know that this can be good i don't know for half of the country the other half will oppose it and so here it's the world struggle between the um the the, the welfen and the Hohenstaufen. um that is all intertwined with the international uh, situation and as we know by tradition yet another thing the royal crown of germany was entrusted electively to a character that was liked by the four dukes that usually was one of them selves in fact and uh, in fact the, the elected were eventually crowned in aachen so the older Carolingian capital of, of the empire and assumed uh, the title of thus king of the Romans right um, with which it was uh, intended that he was the legitimate candidate to the imperial crown now here we can't digress how the thing had come to be as you know as we were saying at the very beginning it was actually something customary right and still at this time the the imperial mechanisms from inter institutional point of view were known of the ones that were eventually crystallized in uh, you know uh, with the golden ball and but la the later tradition so th there wasn't even a fixed number of electors actually and there were many more than this just this four dukes right that these were just the the most influential figures but you know that it was a pretty messed up situation where uh, of course there was never a full you know a unanimous consensus and so there were cer po certain political conjunctures that were necessary to rule in the first place Frederick Barbarossa would be one of those who got some of the best ones that allowed him to to enact uh, the most energetic uh, energetic policy of all, of all the own stuff and it was also quite you know quite coldly calculated and very very uh, very effective also from a strategic point of view at least you know for, for the forces that were you know mobilized for, for again for a world that up to this point had even had difficulties to compact properly imperial resources in in, in, uh, in, in the vast of a single sovereign especially when he was struggling with the papacy and, you know the excommunication would feel would make feel all the all the German princes that opposed them, you know, absolutely dissolved from any, from any, any kind of loyalty to him, and so starting to doing what they were just, what they, they knew how to do best it is usurping public rights, royal rights, and so essentially building a privatistic power that would, by itself, counter this idea of, of public authority. That up to that point. Um, in Germany, a bit as in, in all those countries that, as we've seen, had not been yet fully feudalized in a Western sense, uh, paradoxically was was stronger, right? Because it was less challenged by local, the compaction of, of local feudal powers that are uh, very, a very strong glue. This is the same a bit for even, I don't know, the Western Slavic countries and such that paradoxically, you know, yes, more primitive, but in, in this regard, less, let's say, crippled by the the, the, the incredible uh, decentralized fix that feudalism had uh, brought Europe in, in, in at least in the first centuries of its own development right now was trying great difficulties to be surpassed and would be surpassed because also feudalism actually thanks paradoxically exactly to that glue was was a was a, a better standpoint to centralize at some point rather than um, as medieval France in the 13th century would, would show rather than you know just being uh, a problem but also different countries would have different uh, different uh, dynamics in this sense and we can't digress like this 
Um, in any case, it, it was an incredible, an incredibly delicate balance, right? And and this the fact of the imperial crown and aiming at, at it naturally entailed all a series of political and strategical capacity that was needed to descend to Rome to be crowned by the Pope, because that was the only way to become an emperor in the first place. And not only, in between you had to secure the Italic crown, without which you could not institutionally seize the imperial one, and Italians were not very happy, as you know, as you know in, 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 in the dual story, to see at least what were the projects of, of the Orangestaufen uh, towards their own autonomies. So it was actually a pretty... Uh, you know, a pretty difficult situation because also lots as we were saying at the beginning you know so so many uh, foreign powers intervened in this local political issues right uh, there are some Byzantine chronicles that tell I don't know that at, by the time of, uh, of Frederick Barbarossa's first expedition to Italy that was a you know pretty pretty rough one in terms of what the German army endured because of this constant sabotage and obstacles and, you know, uh, road blocking and so on, that, you know, allegedly there, there were Byzantine agents in every single Italian city to oppose the uh, the German emperor at that point because of that, in that specific contingency they were opposed to one another. So you can imagine how, in a sense also, how ambitious these plans were. I mean, what what kind of, you know, of... of, of um, magnanimity and in, in, in enormity of, of, of moral uh, you know of, of determination and a conviction a Germanic emperor had to be to, to presume even that they could bring down such in you know such an enormity of forces that were you know uh, you know uh, expanding themselves in this point and so what also the the brutality of the, the the deterrent force or properly the, of military action had to be uh, enacted in the process. Uh, so, furthermore, from the 10th to the 11th century, the uh, King of Germany had, in fact, also the secured traditionally the, the 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 right over the two royal crowns of Italy and Burgundy, which. Um, which had a special significance. As we've seen, the, the, the Italic one was the most important one, kind of for obvious reasons, because it, it, first of all, it connected with Rome. Secondly, because literally Italy at this point was the, the, the richest per capita uh, country uh, in the world. And the, all the revival of Roman law that could be used for the emperors to, to stress their own progress over the papacy was being developed there. Uh, it was just in the center of Mediterranean. That's the, the where they 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 would you know uh, a Roman emperor would operate from to to recompose all the the Mediterranean power, launching the Crusades, reuniting the the, the Eastern and Western churches, all these things. Burgundy was was more, in this sense, less of a. Uh, uh, you know, it doesn't. It's not even a matter of how. Constant how centralized power, royal power was in these areas because you know that Italy didn't have a king, even though it was a kingdom. Uh, Burgundy, basically also at this point, uh, but it was more more of a feudal land, but it was of great importance at least because of it. It, it controlled the Rhone Valley, and so basically all the traffics that from the same the same Italy passed to 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 Flanders. So the main uh, commercial axis in, in medieval Europe, uh, especially at this point, was you know an, an enormity of, of goods passed from this. So seizing its control was extremely relevant, and at this point, still the Kingdom of France wasn't so you know compact and you know uh, annoying uh, for for a German policy at that point to to secure the uh, a Burgundian title and uh, and and so. This was, had been built like mostly as a as a custom, right? Because th this whole thing had really hadn't really been established by anybody. I mean that in, in medieval times, power was seized by those who were fit, like properly from a juridical point of view. There was no such thing like, you know, a, a national criterion and the base of which had to, who had to rule, 
right? Very often these powers preferred even a foreign dynast. Uh, that's exactly what happened with the Hohenstaufen to Sicily, right? You, the the Sicilo Normans, the the Oldville could say, you know, we just give power to one of our barons. Of course not, because the barons were the same ones like the German princes that were striving to you know, decentralize and to break down the system. So they they thought well to to choose. Actually, there there were other proponents that were the English, for example, because of the you know of the um, of the Norman connection of the two countries. But eventually, the thing was for for Germany. In any case, um, this sum of titles and of crowns was indeed of the King of Germany, the um, uh, factually because the King of Germany was just King of Germany, but because of this access to, for example, the, the, the Roman crown in Aachen, and then eventually this idea that those were the ones who would have to become Holy Roman Emperors, Casimirly, which, which is a title, by the way, that as in this diction appears in exactly in Frederick Barbarossa's time, um, the main effect of, say, the Germanic Emperor, say better, the most prestigious ruler in the West. But as we've just said, in practice, however, his powers were very limited. Because, as we've seen, they were subordinated to the agreement with the four ethnic duchies. They're great vassals, because feudalism, yes, was mounting up now, and it, but already existed in some way. Um, and the same cities that were growing at this point, in urbanization, especially the Rhineland, right, and uh, the, the, in fact, southern Germany itself, including Swabia, I mean, the cities were, these were the areas that by since Roman times have been, in fact, the most developed of uh, Germany, the closest to civilization, to contacts, the great waterways of the, the Rhine, the Danube, and so on. Cologne was one of the largest cities uh, in Europe at this point, and that's, in fact, where also the, the, the world Ger German, um, say, lay and ecclesiastical power had developed the most. I mean, think about the three, uh, the three um, great electors. Uh, ecclesiastical uh, electors that were all, you know, Rhineland powers, like from Cologne, Mainz, and uh, and Trier, even though it's a bit more distant, but say even usually the places like of, of election of the German king, like Frankfurt, uh, yes, unmined, but still basically it's in, it, it, all in the proximity of these great uh, axes in west, western and southern Germany. Um, and uh, there was all a, an important institutional mechanisms here that had essentially, like in other countries, made the, the, the clergy uh, the supporting public authority, right? Because they were at least originally more subjected to, uh, to the threat, at least properly by prerogative, like the, the, the clergy could, uh, the like ecclesiastical lords could not exercise some uh, some justice functions, right? You know, in coping with with crime or putting people to death and so on. So, but eventually the, the system would collapse even in this regard uh, with the privatization in the 13th century. But at this point, still, the the German crown relied importantly on on the ecclesiastical lords, um, and the cities were were also a very interesting tool to to undermine the the great uh, lay houses that were essentially feudal in nature and in power, right? In Germany, cities would kind of never constitute a, like, true, uh, like, regional powers, right? They would mostly coalize in, in two leagues and eventually just preserving their own independence as free cities, as they were often uh, titled by the same emperor to have them, in fact, more loyal. Uh, but Outside the city walls, it was the the prince or the bishop that ruled. So feudalism eventually in Germany kind of remained the standard thing. You can argue up to, literally up to Napoleon or beyond, right? So um, the 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 very rich and florid urban centers of the Rhineland made often uh, an independent policy guided by their own bishops. We made a video about Cologne, for example, uh, we've seen how the uh, the burghers fundamentally managed to expel the, the bishop itself from the city. Like, all around was a, a an ecclesiastical lordship, territorially, but the city uh, uh, still was, was uh, 
governing itself after a while. This would happen in the 13th century, by the way, but the, already the, the prestige of the of the uh, these communities was was rising. Excuse me, I drink a little. So, <clears throat> at the death of Henry V of Franconia, um, so the essentially the last Franconian uh, ruler, um, the German policy came to an impasse because the the nobility split in a in a faction favorable to the Dukes of Bavaria, and for this reason called eventually what say Guelph in the Italianization of the term that came historiographically came in fact from Welf, that was the um, you know the the ancestor of the 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 Bavarian ducal family, from which the Welfen plural as this party, let's say that was eventually to oppose the the, the Hohenstaufen. And in fact, another faction, instead of the Dukes of Swabia, that had inherited the policy of the Franconian emperors, because they had stuck to them even in the darkest of, of, of times during the excommunication. Basically, that's how the Hohenstaufen made it. They weren't particularly powerful on their own up to that point, but they kind of, you know, were, you know, yes, reasons also of proximity but not all it was probably a political choice to stand with Henry IV to Henry V even in this uh, well they were losing control in the country and so they had managed to marry into the same Franconian uh, line and this faction was known as uh, eventually again the, the term Ghibelline that comes from the castle of Weiblingen that was one of the most important ones held by the family of the Hohenstaufen that uh, had literally uh, eventually been assigned the Duchy of Swabia by Henry IV right that that's how it had become um, and this was uh, Weibling and famously enough was also the, the Hohenstaufen battle cry um, and so on so uh, we're looking essentially at this southwestern German nobility, so we're talking mostly about the the regions of in fact still today's uh, Swabia, uh, Baden-Württemberg, and, and even partly of of, of Switzerland, because this this was the Duchy of Swabia, broadly speaking. Where that's m m the, the most important German dynasties have essentially stem from there. The Hohenstaufen, eventually the Habsburgs, even the Hohenzollern, they were all kind of essentially Swabian, uh, all in, in certain lands of Switzerland, and some at least the Habsburgs had a softer and Burgundian bias in origin. Let's say they they were still Swabian houses properly met. Um, and uh, the title of King of Germany and thus of Emperor was uh, first uh, attributed to Lothar of Supplenburg, Duke of Saxony. So this um, uh, important, you know, warlike air, you know, that where the Ottonians had come, you know, was a very harsh, primitive land um, that had an important degree of militarization and had been supported by the Bavarians as well, so by the Welfen. Now, Lothar of, Supp uh, of, of Supplenburg um, uh, reigned from 1125 to 1137, and he, however, discontented the German nobility, right, because, first of all, um, it was accused. It was was a thing, ever since the you know investiture controversy, to be too lenient to surrendering, let's say, towards Pope Innocent II. Uh, whom he backed against the Norman Duke uh, Roger, who had who had proclaimed himself as King of Sicily, and Sicily was considered a papal f uh, fief, and and the Pope did um, not uh, like pretty much the, the self. Uh, proclamation um, and also because Lothar had uh, uh, essentially granted the Pope the uh, what let's say what, what the German emperors had l literally bled in order to defend that is to say the uh, rights on the uh, of Matilda of, of Canossa's uh, inheritance 
right, that uh, she had left to the church. It was a uh, very important amount of land that stretched mostly through ac across central and northern Italy, um, and that you know had been claimed by the emperors. However, as it was essentially, I mean, Matilda had was a a fief holder of the empire as well, and so um, they had contested her that uh, she couldn't, she didn't have any 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 right, right, any permission to make a testament to dispose of those goods that, as feudal ones, did belong to her on the side of possession, as you know, but not on the one of property, properly meant. So, uh, this was uh, an incredibly intric intricate uh, situation. We've, we've never actually talked about it, but it's really important because these things continued for centuries and centuries, because these, these were, were triggered from, like, from the time of Charlemagne, up to essentially Rudolf of Habsburg, in 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 line not not specifically the Matildine legacy, but uh, the inheritance, but also lots of other territories that had the empire and the papacy had never fundamentally settled on whom they they actually belonged because it was all the issue of of the fact among the other things that the papacy was yes like a spiritual power, but it ruled over people and land, and so what did whom did that land belong to, because if, if the papacy is really just a spiritual power, it doesn't even belong to the empire. At that point, you know, shouldn't even claim any temporal possession. This was the, the the huge deal of the investiture controversy, and it was factually a struggle on the Italic ground. And 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 so what the, the papacy could influence on through its connections, through its influence on these communities that in fact prefer definitely to remain autonomous, not to having emperors telling them, um, you know, to, to give them everything, because it, in name it belonged to them. Now, in 1137, the German nobility preferred thus to choose uh, Lothar's uh, successor in the person of his political enemy. That was Conrad of Swabia. Duke of Swabia. Now this is interesting because given the political fragmentation of Germany you can almost measure how an emperor like like a, a, a king was powerful or not because uh, being there no central assets fundamentally and there were effectively different countries kind of coming together deciding who had normally the, this, the courts were itinerant for example it was a, a lot of interaction so when you realize that, that these rulers didn't even actually quite reached certain parts of the country, didn't have large military power, at least they were bogged down in the process, etc. You, you, you can factually measure what, what the level of political support that they could have, and it was a, a very intricate um, situation. And there is also a, a medieval Germany playlist that I began also to, to make videos on, specifically together with uh, the one of, of, of medieval Italy to, to, to give, let's say, render back a bit of more of of, uh, of adequate attention to, to the Holy Roman Imperial system that explained this mechanism and so everything was based on um, on particularism a lot it was a, a, a continuous negotiation with any kind of dynasty and, and city and whatever right so bishopric and etc um, and however also Conrad of Swabia disappointed the German nobility's expectations, because Conrad didn't manage to to actually put an end to to a internal uh, war fundamentally, which was a big deal f for an emperor, because the emperor should be the supreme ruler. Uh, you know, he who bears this war has to exercise justice to pacify. As the first thing that was properly in Germany, this institutional measure that is the Landfrieb. We also talked about it. That was properly yet. You know, when some vassals didn't cut it off, it was not I'd say not like a crusade, but kind of the idea that, that you know that, that, that there had to be a concentration of force to put down that kind of disobedience. Um, and another very important blow to in this case also to, to, to the German international um, let's say standpoint was the uh, the uh, f the failure of the Second Crusade 
it was known as the shame of of uh, of Edessa from 1147 to 1149 was a as you know the second crusade was a, was a disaster uh, also in part because the french and the germans began to quarrel <laughs> among each other along the way they were divided and kind of and so this was a big blow because you know uh, the crusades were waged in fact by rulers of the caliber of the German and French one and so especially the German one was you know was was claiming to be the most important one because of this uh, universal Roman prerogative and so um, you know uh, the, the, the defeat of in a crusade at that point was much more easily attributable by those who we wanted to unload the responsibility to rather, you know, you are the emperor, I'm just a king, you know, it's your fault, right? Because the empire that derives from God, God is, you know, the, the only one who delivers victory, so it didn't give victory, it's not much because of, of anybody but, but the emperor. So, uh, at the death of Conrad in 1152, the German princes elected as successor his uh, young uh, nephew, Frederick, Duke of Swabia, later on famous, nick, famously nicknamed in Italy as the, the Barbarossa because of the red uh, uh, blonde uh, color of, of his beard and, 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 uh, beard and hair. Um, and he who had, by the way, accompanied his uncle in the crusade, Frederick Barbarossa had gone to the Second Crusade, had you know, had uh, this important military experience. You know, Frederick Barbarossa was one of the greatest commander of the in his time. So, the the military training was basically uh, at this point kings were still seen more or less like just like a uh, primi inter pares, right? As even as knights, right? There was this idea of a still individual prowess of warrior that you know was still quite physically individually meant to have. So. Frederick really was a, a very, also a very, as determined as third, let's say, in his, uh, in his, uh, in his command, in his, in his fight. And, in fact, he displayed already, just politically, in front of the German nobility, the, the energies and the moral strength that seemed to be capable of, also of granting the pacification um, of the other various German factions, it was an advantage here due also to the uh, to the to um, to the dynastic background of the Hohenstaufen, because Frederick um, descended from his father's side, of course, from from the Dukes of, of Swabia, but from his mother's side, from the Dukes of Bavaria. Right. In fact, the the Hohenstaufen and the Welfen were basically the same. Uh, at this point, we're, we're intertwined. We're the same, some branches of the same family. So, in in, in this point, he um, started uh, in managed to start in Germany a conciling policy that essentially a grand, great spa, uh, great space to the um, nobility, the high nobility of the kingdom, which was definitely a very good way to cope the most powerful forces uh, of the country. Uh, and that, uh, in in a particular way, was founded on the, in fact, uh, concord between Frederick and his powerful cousin, Henry, known as the Lion, quite eloquently, that um, in the meanwhile, however, had become very powerful because had reunited in his own hands the two duchies of Saxony and of Bavaria, at the same time. So the, the situation had importantly compacted from a political point of view. You understand also how feudal, you know, like dynastic ties are important in this sense because they, they manage, this is just a conjuncture, right? It could have gone otherwise, but you know, that brought essentially to see Germany divided into great areas orientatively, despite still of the, the very complex framework in this territorial dominations actually were and that um, would roughly equate in fact to this mostly southwestern and northeastern 
uh, German reality very approximately because also Bavaria is of course a southern land and uh, um, but um, it's um, like as we will see this influenced the same as we we're saying in the beginning the same um, the same political and strategic interests of the two right uh, ideally in fact uh, Frederick uh, would was more interested in the in the Mediterranean policy uh, Henry more in the can argue that the Germans say that the one the Saxon one the Baltic one as well so some two different directions two two different cultures because of the lands that were ruled also as, as we were saying before there were important differences between the the rich wealthy um, and can develop urbanized and southwest the also the Rhine lands maybe and the 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 rough primitive militarized and yet still importantly thriving because mostly of sea trade and these communities of from starting from Lübeck uh, were founded by the same Welfen etc from from the other side in in the north right in and so this is more or less the the background we we can we can present for the uh, let's say the, the rise to power of Frederick Barbarossa and, w and we will see at uh, in some in other videos this uh, you know how the thing went for him but it's important to to get how it had properly even come to happen and and what limits and 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 also advantages and opportunities and potential and strength came from from this from this conjuncture. Now, for now, uh, in fact, we stop here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.